What's up, people? My name is Patrick Sheese. I'm an architect with Ubico, and today we're going to look at hybrid remote work, what it means, what some of the implications are for companies that are trying to stay secure, and what you and your organization can do to protect your workforce wherever they are. Spoiler alert, the answer is in the title of the presentation. The definition of where we work is changing fast, especially due to the events of the past couple of years. Some companies were ready for it, but honestly, some were not. This concept of a single computer chained to a desk being the only place we work is rapidly diminishing. People are accessing their communication and collaboration tools from wherever makes sense for them, increasingly not in the same places or styles that they were five or more years ago. As the needs of our workers shift to this work where makes sense hybrid model, the amount of pressure on IT service organizations to enable a flexible yet productive workplace has exploded. The challenge of keeping people happy and productive while also maintaining a fit for risk security posture, it's a big problem to solve. There's so many factors in play from securing user access to remaining compliant with the constantly changing regulations to simply not ending up on the front page of the Wall Street Journal because your company just got hacked. How can we provide a delightful experience for users and keep them safe at the same time? One approach to proactive security that's been gaining popularity over the past few years is known as zero trust. Now, without diving into the black hole of debates on how to implement a zero trust model, the big idea is to start by throwing any concept of assumed trust or standing access on a network out the window, even for administrators. Unlike the traditional flat network design patterns where if you're authenticated, maybe at a device level, you're joined to a network, you can just traverse it freely because you're already authenticated, must be good, right? And you don't worry too much about trying to mitigate threats coming from inside the network, you just focus on trying to keep the bad stuff out. On the other hand, a zero trust model requires that you explicitly verify a user's credentials and other environmental or contextual things like uh, device health, location, or risk before granting them access to a document or a website. This means that you have to be super intentional about who you grant access to and what you grant them access to. You more or less have to run with the assumption that bad things can and will happen, or what some people typically refer to as assume you've already been breached. This sounds pretty daunting, and it is especially for organizations that have a seemingly untangleable web of legacy practices and infrastructure. You may have heard people say things like, identity is the new perimeter. Again, highly debatable talking points. Maybe instead of saying it's the new perimeter, let's think about it as one of the most important parts of a much larger problem. If we have to evaluate user credentials all the time, we need a fast, secure, relatively easy way for people to prove that they are who they claim to be. In other words, we need strong, user-friendly authentication. Let's start by looking at passwords. Generally pretty user-friendly, especially when used by themselves as a single factor of authentication. I can get in and out of my accounts in a couple of seconds, and so can hackers. In a lot of cases, passwords are implemented as a best-we've-got solution due to limitations in either technology or scalability. What is it about passwords that are so weak and hackable? I personally feel pretty responsible. I use a password manager. Is the problem me? Great question. There was an amazing article by Alex Weinert from a couple years back called Your Password Doesn't Matter, $2 signs for the, the S's on password. The gist of the article is that only in a password spray attack or brute force cracking attacks does the actual password have any bearing on whether someone's account got compromised? Otherwise, hackers are getting passwords from breached websites or email phishing, malware, social engineering, or in some cases, even extortion. Now, maybe with the exception of extortion, the best way to kick these threat vectors in the pants is to use multi-factor authentication, or MFA. Typically, when we refer to authentication factors, we're talking about something you know, like a password or a pen, or something you have, like the Microsoft Authenticator app on your phone or a security key, or something you are, perhaps a biometric or a facial scan. And there certainly are other factors that may be more sophisticated, like somewhere you are, your location, or something you do, such as a typing rate or how you sign your name. 
But for the most part, we're only going to focus on the three that we mentioned first. Any combination of the usage of these factors is known as multi-factor. And it can be used to keep hackers at bay and reduce the likelihood of account takeover by up to 99.9%. 99.9% sounds really good on paper, but it's important to note that not all MFA is created equal. There are different levels of protection that you get for each type and each has its own threat vectors. To expand on this, I want us to look at an example of how easy it is to fish traditional SMS one-time passcodes. Those six or so digit codes you get texted when you're trying to log into a website or some service. Let's say for whatever reason, you're tired, you're having a bad day, you let your guard down and you get tricked into visiting a fake website maybe through a super convincing email or a text message. Once you get there, if the attackers did a convincing job, you'll get something that looks more or less exactly like the website you were expecting. Nothing seems wrong. You type in your username and password, and like clockwork, your first authentication factor is compromised. Now, as soon as the attacker gets your password, they can immediately use it to log into the real website, which, as you might expect, texts you that six digit one time passcode. And what do you do? You type it in and again, it's intercepted by the attacker who at this point gets access to the real service that you were trying to access. You're redirected to either a fake failed login page or maybe a clone of the service you tried to access. Congrats, they got you good, you just got owned. Now I know this sounds pretty complicated to pull off, but you'd be surprised how easy it is to do. There's tools like Modlishka, that have been popping up, they're easy to find on the web, and they can really be used by anyone with a minimal amount of effort or technical knowledge. Another popular attack that hackers are, are using now is called SIM swap. And in this case, they might not even need to steal your second factor. Think about it. SMS goes over public channels, something you literally cannot control. If an attacker convinces a phone carrier to swap your phone number to their SIM card that they own, they can essentially become you, and that's pretty scary. It's probably obvious that we need something better, especially if we're going to embrace a new, potentially vulnerable way of work. How can we provide secure, reliable access to our workforce in a way that isn't overly burdensome for users? In my opinion, the best way to tackle this is going passwordless. Kick those passwords to the curb and start using strong authentication only. Let's look at the word passwordless. What does it mean? Literally, don't use a password. Okay, I'll buy that, but what do I do instead? Great question, let's take a look. YubiKey is a hardware security key, and it's one of the most powerful weapons in your security arsenal. All right, what's so special about it? Well, it's something that only you have that the hacker does not. And without your key, hackers are dead in the water. Remember those authentication factors we looked at earlier? We've already established if we're gonna do passwordless, we're not going to use passwords, so that's off the table. Instead, let's take a security key and instead of a password, use a PIN. Wait a minute, but PINs are passwords too, right? No, they aren't. <laughs> They're both knowledge factors, but the big difference is that when you use a password, it goes over the internet and is used to authenticate you. In the case of a security key and a pin, the pin only serves the purpose to unlock the authenticator. Let's dig even deeper. There's a term you'll see if you hang around the passwordless world long enough called FIDO2. Basically, Yubico, Microsoft, and a few other big names in the industry cooked up an authentication protocol which satisfies the need for strong passwordless authentication. If you use FIDO2, you can combine the something you have, a security key, with either something you know, a pen, or something you are, a fingerprint. The whole protocol is based on public key cryptography, which means it's virtually impossible to fish or hack remotely. Let's see a couple examples of authentication in action. The first is a login to a Windows 10 device, and the second is a login to a service that uses Azure Active Directory. These will both be using security keys and password lists for login. All right, we're starting with the Windows 10 device. This could be Azure AD joined or hybrid Azure AD joined. From the Windows login screen, 
plug in your YubiKey. It's going to ask you for a pen. Type that in and then tap your YubiKey. Tapping your YubiKey is a pretty cool security feature. It helps prove that you're actually physically there and that you're not being hacked remotely. All right, we're in. Next, let's open a web browser such as Microsoft Edge. And for fun, let's check out office.com. You'll note that we're already signed in, which is awesome and by design. You can check your email, use your favorite apps, all without having typed a password. Now let's look at another example. In this case, maybe you aren't on an Azure AD joined device, but we still want to use passwordless authentication to access our apps using Azure AD. Let's open a web browser and head over to office.com. When we get there, we're going to click the sign in button and plug in our YubiKey. From the login screen, if we choose sign in options, one of the options is for us to sign in with a security key. Let's click that. It's going to ask for a pen. We type it in, we tap our key, and as you might expect, we're logged in. Again, without ever having typed a password. All right, that's pretty cool. But Patrick, I'm actually in an organization that isn't quite there yet. We're neck deep in our legacy identity infrastructure, but I really want to do this whole hybrid work thing. All right, no problem. We got you covered. You ever hear people say cliche things like, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon? Well... Yeah, if you're still lugging around your old school identity platforms, let's pause. Let's take a look at what you've got to work with and figure out a good way to enable your hybrid remote workers without going off the rails. We've already looked at YubiKey specifically in the context of FIDO2 passwordless, but that's really the tip of the iceberg. The YubiKey is designed to help organizations bridge from wherever they are to a passwordless future and it supports a wide array of different protocols to help you get there. If you're still on Active Directory on-premises, that's totally fine. Let's check out smart card or certificate-based authentication on a YubiKey. Technically, that's passwordless. You use a pen, something you know, to unlock an authenticator, and then you use a certificate to authenticate against Active Directory instead of a password. Obviously, that's only within the context of being a part of an Active Directory domain, but let's think forward a bit. What if I could use that smart card credential on my YubiKey to somehow authenticate to Azure Active Directory in the cloud? Yeah, you can do that too. Using ADFS or Active Directory Federation services along with Azure AD Connect, you can enable your smart carded Active Directory users to log into cloud services using modern authentication with SAML 2.0 or OpenID Connect and OAuth. And in the future, when you get to the point that all of your applications support modern auth or you decide as an organization to go cloud first, you're going to be in really good shape to do that securely and using technology that your users will appreciate. Remember when we talked about zero trust earlier? Again, without getting into the specifics on implementation, one way to pull off that type of design is with a software defined perimeter or SDP solution. Unlike traditional VPNs, SDPs leverage this explicitly verify principle to manage fine-grained access to specific applications and services. The cool thing, pretty much every major SDP vendor works beautifully with Azure AD and uses strong authentication. All right, moving on. Let's think about where we can make use of passwordless authentication in the context of our business. Remember, if our goal is to enable hybrid remote workers, that could mean all sorts of things. It could be corporate executives or administrators with privileged access. It could be contractors or frontline workers on shared workstations. Or maybe it's a secure call center where mobile phones are restricted. Each of these has one thing in common. They can all leverage passwordless, strong authentication using a YubiKey to get up and running in the most secure way possible. The answer to our original question, what can you and your organization do? to protect your workforce wherever they are, starts with a YubiKey. Give it a shot, your users will love you for it. Hopefully this has inspired you to take a look at implementing passwordless authentication. Maybe you're already doing it to some extent and you wanna venture further down that road towards zero trust in enabling hybrid remote workers. Wherever you're at in your journey, strong authentication, passwordless, it all works best with the YubiKey. 
That said, I am so incredibly excited to share some news with you about a brand new way to get your hands on YubiKeys. Yubico is now the very first company to offer our hardware security keys on the Azure Marketplace. The way it works, just like you'd go to Azure Marketplace to purchase your favorite SaaS or software products, you can search for YubiKey or Yubico and get access to our three-year Yubi Enterprise subscription plan. The billing is split over three years as an operational expenditure. It comes complete with extra buffer stock to help meet the growing demand of your workforce and also provides annual upgrade benefits to help you stay on top of the latest technology. There's a 500 key minimum to take advantage of this service, and we are willing to make special offers to customers, especially if you mention this video. Currently, this is only being offered to marketplace customers who are located in the United States, but if your company is located somewhere else, please still reach out or find a way to make it work. Again, you can find it by searching Yubico or YubiKey on the Azure Marketplace. We would absolutely love to help you get started. So what's next? Send us some feedback on the session, what you enjoyed, what we can improve, how great my hair is. Uh, also, check out our partner showcase during Ignite and get access to an exclusive offer for privileged users, developers, and public sector. Follow us on social media, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. We're all super active on every one of them. Also, check out our website, yubico.com. We keep it up to date with all sorts of great resources, support documentation, and case studies. It's loads of fun. But most importantly, try it out. Stop by our virtual booth. Let's have a discussion. We're here to help. Our company's mission is to make the internet a safer place for everyone. And that starts with you. I'm Patrick Sheese. Hit me up on Twitter at PSheese or on LinkedIn. Thank you so much for watching and enjoy Ignite 2021.